let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually have. Right. Right. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it, believes it's actually in a big piece of that process that a developer, or let's say, a as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask an OpenShift Admin Office Hours live stream. I am Andrew Sullivan, and I am not joined by Johnny today. Uh, so Johnny is uh, unfortunately out for various reasons. He won't be back for a couple more weeks. So I am sorry to say, everyone, that you are you are stuck with me uh, and me alone. So uh, I am, however, joined by Prasant from our OpenShift AI business unit. Uh, I got that right. You are yeah. part of the OpenShift IBU. Yeah. Right. I was 99% sure, and then I had a doubt there right at the last minute. So, uh, Prasant, if you want to uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, I'm Prasant. So I'm one of the technical marketing managers on the OpenShift AIBU. So what I do as a TMM, as they call it, is like I act as a technical liaison between the customers and the OpenShift AI product. So what does that mean? Like I get to wear like multiple hats, like sometimes I'm a data scientist, sometimes I'm a software engineer, but the most important thing is like, I'm a, I'm a customer advocate. So I understand the customer problems or use case and say like, how can you solve it, that with the OpenShift AI product? Yeah. And also the broader Red Hat portfolio. Yeah, tech, tech marketing is fun, you know, because yeah. it's uh, if you've ever seen the movie Office Space, you know, the guy, I deal with yeah. the customers, you know, I, I feel like we do that in reverse, right? We, oh, yeah. we advocate for engineering and the work of the products and everything else out to customers, but we also get to work with customers and advocate for them back into the organization. So it's a lot of fun. Definitely. If, if you're, if you really love like doing a multiple things, like wear a lot of different hats, but like in real world problems, then this is the way to go. Yeah, it's definitely. Challenging. Definitely. I, uh, you know, as someone who's been doing this for, gosh, uh, uh, the better part of a decade at this point, it's something that I very much enjoy. So I'm, I'm not sad about it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Prasanth, and I appreciate it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll circle back around to the topic here in a moment. And um, I, I'm, I'm very curious to learn about today's topic. Uh, so for anybody who's listening and not watching us, um, or if you're watching us afterwards. Uh, so today's topic is DevOps versus ML Ops and uh, Red Hat OpenShift AI brings them together. Uh, so this is one that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, I was, and I feel like I say that every week, but I feel like that's also because we tend to choose topics that we're interested in when Johnny and I are scheduling these things, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I was at an IBM event last week and it was, it was an interesting event because there was five technical tracks and it was like one of them was uh, mainframe, one was quantum, uh, one was cloud, one was AI, and then one was Red Hat, uh, which I found it very interesting that the others are like very technology stack centric. And then there's just this broad Red Hat. Like, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, Anyways, I got to go to uh, several of the sessions. Uh, I, I tended to focus mostly on the AI sessions and just the things that are happening here are fascinating and interesting to me. And I feel like I'm constantly learning new things, uh, which means that it's a, it's a good place to be. Um, at least for me, you know, I, I love learning new things as most folks who have watched the stream before know, um, anytime that we learn stuff, it's a good stream. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, as I said before, Johnny is out for this week and, uh, I think next week as well. I'm not quite sure when he returns. Um, I'll have to text him because I know he is completely disconnected from work stuff right now. So uh, I'll have to text him and check on him. Anyways, um, so this week, I know that this is KubeCon week and historically we don't stream during KubeCon. Uh, so a bit of a mea culpa with Johnny being out and with my personal schedule around work travel and everything else, uh, we haven't been on the air here. So thank you to everybody who's joining us. Uh, we do appreciate it. Um, from me, your name just completely threw me off because I saw your chat pop up and I'm like, from me, how am I sending a message to myself? <laughs> Anyways, um, so sorry, brain reset. Uh, I didn't want to lose basically a full month of streams due to various scheduling conflicts and stuff like that. Plus, this is when you were available, so it works out in the end. 
Um, so this is a office hours live stream here on uh, Red Hat Live Streaming, which means that we are here to answer whatever questions you happen to have in mind. Uh, so from me, I see you have a question there. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, so feel free to ask questions during the live stream, send them through chat, whatever platform you're watching us on. Uh, it all gets aggregated here through Restream and we will be able to see that. Do our best to answer those questions. If we don't know the answers, uh, you know, normally with Johnny and I, one of us can be rambling while the other one asks somebody smarter than us what the what the answer might be. Uh, but if I don't know the the answer today, um, I will take those down and we'll follow up and see if we can get an answer, uh, an authoritative answer for next week, and then follow up during the top of mind segment. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. If you are not watching us live. Uh, so if you're if you're watching us but not live, you can see on the screen there my email address, sully at redhat.com, S-U-L-L-Y. You're welcome to reach out to me at any time. Uh, or if you are uh, if you are on the Kubernetes Slack, uh, you can reach out to us on the OpenShift Users channel, which is a great way to reach out to us as well. And uh, if if you don't uh, if if you send an email to Johnny and not me. Like we we tend to be pretty good about including you, the other one in the uh, responses. So don't hesitate to reach out to Johnny as well. J O N N Y at redhat.com. Okay. Um, top of mind stuff. Uh, so I really don't have a lot of top of mind stuff because I want to direct everyone over to KubeCon. Uh, KubeCon Europe is happening right now over in Paris, France. Uh, I am sad that I'm not able to go there, but uh, I am happy for all of the folks who were able to join. Uh, lots of stuff happening over there. This is where we're doing the official like big marketing announcements around OpenShift 4.15. So if you've been looking at the Red Hat blog, you've probably seen a whole list of blog posts about 4.15 features and capabilities and all this other stuff. Uh, so 4.15 was actually released uh, a few weeks ago. So remember we had the What's New session um, back in mid-February. I believe it was February 28th was the day that 4.15 actually shipped and went out the door. Uh, and then we've just been holding off uh, for KubeCon before the marketing folks make a big deal out of it and you see it all over the headlines and everything else. So we will have a series of topics coming up that talks about OpenShift 4.15 features that are important and relevant for administrators, just like we always do with every one of the releases. Uh, so kind of stay tuned for those. Keep an eye on the schedule. Um, I know, I think we have staged a stream for next week, but I want to say that that one is going to get pushed, uh, because of scheduling conflicts with our guest. Um, so just keep that in mind, but I am planning to still stream. It'll probably be just me. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone, but we'll be talking about some 4.15 stuff. So look forward. I'm looking forward to that one. It, it uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can make it into a technical session. Uh, not that today won't be a technical session, but I want to be like hands on with 4.15 and showing some things. All right. Uh, from me, is there a way to expose non-standard ports like a database port to the internet via ingress? Um, not with the default OpenShift ingress. Uh, so, you know, OpenShift Ingress focuses on HTTP protocol with um, ports 80 and 443 because uh, it's HA proxy on the back end. You could deploy a, you know, use another Ingress from a partner or something like that. You know, use F5, use Citrix. Uh, you know, those are the two that come to mind. I think HA proxy themselves have an operator that you can deploy into the cluster and do it that way. Um, but yeah, o OpenShift and the default OpenShift Ingress uses just HTTP on ports 80 and 443. So you would want to use something like a uh, metal LB and a, or if you're in a hyperscaler, whatever the load balancer provider is there to create a service of type load balancer, or you would want to use a host, po host port slash node port, um, which you could do that. But I don't know. I, I tend to shy, shy away from the host ports and node ports because they one there's a limited number of them and two it actually opens up that port on all of the nodes in the cluster and you don't know where in the cluster the pod or pods may be so you need to have something you know a load balancer or something like that outside of the cluster that's pointing at all of the nodes on that specific port so that they can pick up and be able to access that application so it's not necessarily a straightforward thing you either have to know the node that the port the node that the pod is on so you can address the port on that specific host IP uh, or 
you know, something like a load balancer to abstract it. But thank you for the question. All right, I've rambled for 11 minutes now. Uh, so Prasant, uh, please. Uh, so today's topic is, um, I think this might be one of the first AI, you know, ML ops centric streams that we've done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I want to start off by kind of introducing some of the terms, some of the things that we'll be talking about and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I kind of want to let you just go and do your thing and I'll ask, you know, it's uh, as Johnny and I love to say, right, the, the role that I was born to play, right, dumb guy. Okay. I'll, I'll ask as many questions as I can. Good. Sounds good. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's how I start to, like, you know, like go at a very, very high level and try to explain the terms you know, so that users get the sound understanding there. So today, as Andrew said, like today's topic is about DevOps versus ML ops. So I know now like the buzz is around like AI machine learning, like ML ops, like before we even go down that route, let me go to the other side saying like DevOps. So everybody's familiar, so familiar with DevOps. Now, it has like multiple phases, tools, frameworks, and so many things, but let's go one step higher. So what's DevOps? Like you're essentially talking about a smoothing out the collaboration between two teams, the development and the operations. It's as simple as that. Now, if you take that to the AI machine learning world, you, I can say it's okay. Now we have a machine learning team and the operations team. So now if somebody clear, asks, like, are they this? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, to be clear, it's not. And my brain always wants to say ML ops is, you know, AI or machine learning doing operations. And that's not necessarily the case. No. Yeah, we're not using some sort of AI to, you know, uh, Sky, Skynet, you know, replacement for administrators or operations teams. So, yeah, so th there are two ways to use AI machine learning, right? One, let's say it could be inbuilt into a product or it could be a product that allows you to build that product. Yeah. So here, we're, when, when you say, say about like DevOps or ML ops, you're actually talking about the people, the process, and everything that happens around it. Like, how can you like collaborate and come together so that everything falls into place, like from design to develop and all the way to like uh, deploying it and managing it. So that that's that's how like uh, that's what ML Ops is about. So now within this, you could have like AI machine learning helping the administrator, but that could be that would be an intelligent application by itself. So that could yeah. be anything. But and, when we talk about like ML ops, sorry, DevOps versus ML ops, you're talking about the process size and like the the whole end-to-end um, -end like process and uh, collaboration that happens. Mm -hmm. So can, can I tangent you again for a moment? Yeah, yeah. So I think we have started to use the terms AI, artificial intelligence, and ML, machine learning, interchangeably. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I know that technically there are differences, but you know, should we just assume that when we talk about AI, ML, you know, the, we're just using that interchangeably to basically mean you know one of two or three different things. So, um, you know, one being a so as you said, an intelligent application, an application mm -hmm. that has some sort of AI, ML. Um, augmentation, uh, which I know that's a loaded word as well, uh, to help it function better or help you, you know, the, the user of it do something better. Um, two is, and I think this is where OpenShift AI fits in, it's a platform to use for building things like models. Yep. Um, and models are the, uh, for lack of a better term, they are the intelligence. Yeah. Behind those AI ML applications. Mm -hmm. And then I think three is your applications using your models in order to yeah. enhance whatever your application yeah. organization business is doing. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a real world, like, I mean, like these fancy, like machine learning models, they cannot, there's no point in like self-existing, like they don't serve any purpose. Like 
unless they are actually like integrated into an existing technology stack, like your existing application and so forth. Like say you have an application that predicts what the weather is until like, unless like uh, your existing weather app uses this, there's no point in having that machine learning model. So in a pure sense, we are talking about like a unified ops or like, like we have the traditional application, but it's also using the machine learning functionalities, which makes it an intelligent application or like system as together. So this is where like uh, I would differentiate between AI and machine learning. So let's say like, and we even have for users that are interested, we have a video like in YouTube, like uh, just search for OpenShift AI, AI versus machine learning. There's a video that explains this exactly. And I'll, I'll just give you a gist of it. So and all of us have like, like a streaming service, like where we watch movies and so forth. Now, let's say like you have a bunch of movies. The first time you log in, like you say like, okay, I'm seeing a bunch of movies. Like, okay, let me say like, I give a thumbs up for this, the other two not so. And then you say like, okay, thumbs up for the rest of the choices. Now, the system or like that particular service, like the streaming service, they take the user input and says like, no, I want to understand how this user is providing the rating. So it's trying to learn what the user is providing. So this learning mechanism is called machine learning. And once the user, once it understands how the user, what kind of movies or like uh, a series that the user likes, it has understood the user, which means like it has learned that particular user. Now it doesn't stay there. The user's choice could keep changing every single day. Now, the AI, the broader AI system would be something which continuously evolves or like tunes its learning. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing is called like an AI system. So this could be anywhere like uh, any of those like um, products that you have, like Alexa or things like that. So it it tunes your um, it tunes its system or like knowledge base based on how the user input changes, right? So we have the whole AI system and machine learning is this part where it's trying to learn how the user user is kind of like changing his choices. And is and, that is that the same as like a so a context aware engine yep. versus retraining the model? Mm -hmm. And so because I think there's two different things, right? So one is um, so I, I take a set of data and I input it and it has mm -hmm. things like, you know, when users that, you know, match Andrew's profile, make these selections, mm -hmm. they tend to also like these things. Yep. And so, so that's the initial model. And then the context aware thing is like, oh, Andrew is thumb up or thumb downing these yeah. things. And therefore it skews my personal thing. And maybe that big data set eventually gets fed back in and it retrains you know, the underlying model so that without that context aware stuff, it starts giving yeah. me those things. Exactly, right? Like, so it's, it understands the context. Now it's like adjusting its, itself. So that's the intelligent part. So that's what the whole AI system does it. So yeah. nobody's uh, prescribing it rules. In the past, like we had a deterministic system says like, hey, if user likes X, Y, and Z, do this. But now, it's kind of adapting itself to the environment and relearning and understanding the context and evolving itself. So, you know, that's the whole part of like the AI system being intelligent. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I want to, I'm going to interrupt you real quick to answer uh, from me's question here. Yeah. Uh, so disaster recovery HA setups have seen involve three sites. Uh, is there an option for only two sites? Um, and then uh, like Metro DR, regional DR. So, OpenShift, a single OpenShift cluster requires at least three nodes for uh, HA of the uh, control plane. So in this instance, I want to say, and somebody just called me out um, a couple of weeks ago and I was delivering a session and they're like, we should really standardize the language that we use for high availability versus disaster recovery. Uh, so high availability here is referring to within the same cluster, within the same set of resources, ensuring that workload continues to be available. 
Um, so if I lose a single control plane node, you know, things continue to function. Whereas disaster recovery is the entire cluster is offline. How do I recover, you know, the, the entire set of workloads somewhere else? So HA in this instance would be, how can I protect at least the way I'm interpreting it is how can I protect a cluster that is spanning two sites or using two sites? Um, so spanning two sites, really not any great options because three nodes, um, for control plane HA. Uh, so that means that one site is always going to have uh, the majority of nodes two, um, you know, two in that case. So if that site were to fail, then the surviving site would be read only until one of the control plane nodes comes back. So really the way I approach it is having two separate clusters, um, one at each of those two sites, and then you manage the workload and where it goes inside of there. So you could use something like, um, you know, ODF's Metro DR, ODF regional DR in order to protect that data. Various storage partners also have solutions there. Um, NetApp comes to mind, Dell EMC comes to mind. Uh, I know HPE also does some things there. Uh, Portworks, um, it, there's a whole bunch of them. You know, a lot of them support various replication. Usually the hard part is how do I reintroduce? Um, so my primary site has failed. How do I reintroduce the workload at the secondary site or the recovery site? Um, historically, and if Johnny were here, he would be banging the GitOps, GitOps gong um, because GitOps is a great way because uh, you know I'm here is my workload. I'm describing it in a declarative manner, and if something happens to that site, I just use Argo CD to redeploy everything at the recovery site. Uh, but you could also do things like. Uh, and there's several blog posts of this on uh, the Red Hat blog of use like a global load balancer. Um, so I have the application deployed in both sites. It's doing some sort of replication between them. I use a global load balancer so that traffic coming in when the site fails is just automatically redirected to the other site. Uh, and then Babuni asks, uh, so this is a question for you, Prasad. Um, yeah. So to learn OpenShift AI slash ML ops, what are the prerequisite technologies to complete first? So let me uh, go back and so to understand AI ML ops, like you need to focus on three main pillars. The first is the model development or call this model training and then model serving. So that is like once you train the machine learning model, how do you take it and deploy it so that you can um, start running inference against it. And then the third part is like the model monitoring. So that's where like Okay, you've got the model, it's in running in production, but you still want to like monitor it or like manage it. And since you want to make sure like the model does what it is supposed to do. So you kind of like focus on those three pillars. And that's like the breadth of it. Now, if you go into the depth, like model training, I would say like start looking into some of the popular frameworks like uh, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so forth, and within and within that, like you want to understand like the generic way in like models are trained, like what kind of algorithms are used. So I would say like there, the, there are like classical algorithms, like regressions, like classification, and going all the way to like deep learning, like neural network models, and now the latest uh, being like large language models, like ChatGPT. So. How, how they actually function. So you don't have to like go into the details of it, but how do you uh, train the models, use the models and so forth. And that's that's the realm of a data scientist primarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, model uh, serving. So once you have, so depending on the framework that you see, let's, let's assume that you're using TensorFlow, each of these frameworks have a way of uh, exposing, like downloading the models, and exposing it in the form of an API. So you could use uh, a container platform like OpenShift, like where you just uh, containerize that particular model, expose uh, an API to it, or use frameworks like what uh, OpenShift AI uses underneath, like Model Mesh, KSO, because they uh, take out the burden of like you dealing with uh, the different frameworks. How do you wrap it around exposing it as an API? So those would be suggestions for under model um, serving. So with, with model monitoring, so you got to understand the concept of like a drift. So when we are training a machine learning model, 
we are actually focusing on the data and the pattern that could produce the data. So unlike the traditional development path where like you're just monitoring the application for performance or like security and so forth, the concern here would be like, has the data changed? Because the model by the model could model is probably like good, like there's nothing wrong with it, but the data that it was trained completely changed. This could happen a lot. So you want to keep an eye on it. So you want to understand like, how do I check for like model drift and like what are the different frameworks and tools that can actually do it. And okay. when you want to put together all the three, you definitely want to understand about like pipelines because these three steps, like you can do it manually, but if you had to do it all over and over again, like automation is the way in. So you got to understand about like pipelines. Sorry, I, I'm watching myself on the screen and the dog stretched so you can see the dog's paw just above <laughs> my name tag here. <laughs> I'm easily distracted. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so I, I think it's also, I, I want to point out that you don't have to be a data scientist yeah. to, to do, to utilize, to take advantage of, you know, all of these things. And, yeah. you know, I, I think chat GPT, you know, and all of these other things are a perfect example of that, of yeah. somebody else is building that model and maintaining that model and effectively, we are taking advantage of the model serving aspect, yeah. which is, you know, my, you know, my user clicked on this button in the application and it sends something over to the model serving apparatus and yeah. it does what it does with that input and gives you back some outputs that you then use somehow in your application. Yeah. In the case of chat GPT, right, it's taking, you know, my spoken words, you know, language and interpreting that and then using, um, what is it? Real-time augmentation RAG? Uh, no, I don't remember what RAG stands for. Real-time augmented generation mm -hmm. where yeah. Yeah. it will, in real time, it will reach out and incorporate, you know, internet search, search results or, you know, various other things to craft a response back to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you don't, you don't have to be a data scientist to be yeah. deeply involved with, with AIML. Yeah, and, and sorry, like I, I was, that's retrieval augmented generation. But yeah, yeah. I mean, as Sandra said, like, see, don't get bogged down by uh, that. Like, there's a lot of math behind AI machine learning, but we've come so far that you really don't have to worry about the math and machine learning. I mean, you still have to, but there are ways for you to like um, extract the output without worrying about like how it was implemented, what's the math behind it. So as you can see, like if you had to go back a decade, like all the machine learning models, you have to under understand the details because when you have a machine learning model, like uh, you basically, it was a pattern. When I say a pattern, it's, it's a mathematical formula. And to use that mathematical formula, you need to understand what the formula is about. Like, how do you provide the inputs? Like what format do I provide the inputs? How do I wrap this into an application and so forth? But you don't have to worry about that now. Like you've got like tons and tons of like frameworks, tools, and libraries yeah. that you just simply pass in the data. And that's, and you know, OpenShift AI, like that's what it uh, basically goes end to end. It's so easy for an end user to develop an intelligent application without having to worry about all the nitty gritty details underneath. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think that answers. You know, we we eventually got to the answer to Babuni's question. I think there. Yeah. Um, we we just side barred to yeah. answer other questions that were coming from me, which is things that we would have addressed eventually in the normal. Uh, my questions were things that I think we would have addressed normally throughout the uh, conversation today, anyway. So, uh, Babuni, if that didn't help or or didn't uh, answer your question completely, just let us know in the chat. Um, so jumping back, um, before I in interrupted you for questions, uh, Prasanth, so DevOps, MLOps. Um, yeah. so you were talking about, you know, sort of level setting for DevOps and MLOps and what that means. Yeah. So, you know, like anytime you talk about these two concepts, like there's always like, uh, the question is like, are they the same or are they different? Because they have ops in their name. So are they the same or not? So. 
And th- th- there are like two different worlds, right? Like we're talking about a development team, like a machine learning team. team. Yes, they're, the workflow's different, like how they uh, come up with the model or design, develop the model versus a traditional application. Those are all different. But if you look at it conceptually, they are actually the same. So, and I can I can actually say this because I've been in the software engineering world and a data scientist world. So, I, it's if, if you have a data scientist or like a software engineer and you tell them like they're the same, like it's, there's nothing to be offended about it. Like, because conceptually the same, because you are trying to like uh, seamlessly uh, collaborate between two teams and what's the process you follow? Like, it's kind of like uh, interchangeable. So, well, now there might be argument saying like, well, it's not just two teams. Like, okay, what about data and ML team, like dev and ops team? Now it becomes data, ML, dev, ops team. So, you know, there are multiple ways to put this. Don't forget security in there. (laughs) I know. It's like there are so many ways to put this, but uh, if you look at the different uh, stages involved in uh, DevOps, and also look at what ML ops involves, you can clearly see that, oh, they're pretty much the same. It's, there are different tools, but they're pretty much the same. So I can probably go uh, a little bit into the details. So uh, so let's start with... Uh, well, so my high level recap there is, so DevOps is developer and application teams working together with operations teams for you know at the platform level to help mm-hmm. the application stay available to scale correctly to you know do the things that it needs to do ml ops is effectively the same thing but instead of an application team it's more or less a data science team yeah yeah and and the definition is kind of like the boundaries thin nowadays like it could be a data scientist machine learning engineer like statisticians or anybody who develop any team that comes out with the machine learning model so yeah got it Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Good. Uh, so let's let's dive a little bit deeper. Now we made it clear. Okay, it's between teams. So with DevOps, like traditionally, it, it involves like you start with the core, then go to the build phase, then you're testing the builds and like making sure the, placing the quality controller out. Then you're releasing it. That's like where the CI/CD comes in place, and then you're deploying it and then you're monitoring it and that whole infinity loop kind of like continues right so let's dissect it one step at a time now with devops and ml ops let's start with coding so coding like the focus is on like writing the code and like version control so with devops you call this you call it as development and the ML ops world, we say like it's training. So it's if you call it model development, nobody's going to come after you because it's eventually the same. You're all writing codes either to come up with the traditional app or like the model. So with the, the DevOps, like when you're coding, like how do you do that? You start with the design and then you start to write the code. You choose a language and like so. The byproduct is the code itself, but this is where like it slightly differs in the ML ops world where like you start you start with the data and you're trying to understand like what is the pattern that could have led to this data. So you're eventually trying to discover the pattern. So even though you're writing a piece of code that could tell you what this pattern is, the focus here is not on the code itself. Uh, it, it's it, you need that, but the actual focus is the data and the model or like the pattern that comes out of it. And often a lot of people get confused, like what is a machine learning model? Like everybody says it's a ML model, Well, it's, it's just like a, a binary dump period. Like it has details about like what that particular mathematical formula is. And the simplest example I could give us is like a linear regression. So I'm sure like, a lot of the people like you you know what's the equation of a straight line is so y is equal to mx plus b now the model stores this in a file and it gives values to the parameters the slope and the intercept 
Now that is a very, very simple model. Now, when you consider like the models that we have now, like chat GPD, consider instead of having like two parameters, you have a billion parameters yeah. and that's really complex. So, you know, or more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's growing every single day. So, so that's why like, so, you know, now you understand the coding conceptually, it's the same. You're writing a piece of code to kind of achieve a functionality. So you're here, you're writing a piece of code to kind of understand the pattern. So the byproduct here is the code itself, but the byproduct here is like the data. I mean, we have the input data. So we have the, the byproduct is the data and the model or the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's like step one, right? Like, so we have the code, we understood what the, uh, what the app is or like what the, the model is. So everything is ready. So what's the next step? Now, we have to make sure it's in a format that's ready for use by the customer or the user. In a typical DevOps world, like, what do we do? We compile it. So what does that mean? We're just putting the code or like the different parts of the code in the correct order so that, you know, at the end of the output process, like we have the executable or it's in a format that can be readily consumed by the user. So, which means I can use the code now. Now, the same thing happens on the ML ops world where like you have this pattern locally, either in memory or like on your local disk. Now you just wanna dump it in a format that can be consumed by the user. And most often, like the frameworks that you use, like TensorFlow or PyTorch, allow you to do this. So it's automated there. Like, just like how uh, you would have like Maven, Make, or Ant, or anything in your DevOps world, we have uh, libraries and tools that exist within the frameworks that allow you to output a build. We don't call it as a build, but we just call it as a model. So there are still like tools and frameworks that allow you to like get to this stage. So it's funny, we started I've with the never thought of it that way. Huh? I've never thought of it that way as being, you know, basically very, very similar things yeah. with different language. Yep. So if you now if you let's put them together, like so we started with the requirement, have a code. Now we had a the same like we wanted to find a pattern, we had a model. Now we went to the build stage where, okay, I'm converting this into a format that's usable by the customer or the user. It's plain as simple as that. And the next stage, what, what happens in a DevOps world? Like we test it. We need to make sure it works. The same thing in MLOps world. I know the data scientist said like the model is super good. It's, it's so accurate, it's, but we need to test it period. So that's where you validate the model. And, you know, like, just like here, there might be multiple teams involved, like a QE team or, you know, um, like have like the developers do like unit test, integration test, black box test. There's so many ways to do it. Just like that in the ML ops world, like there's like so many ways to test the specific model. Like you can do cross validation. The technique is different but the concept is the same. You want to make sure it works. That's it. And once that is done, this is where like you move to the, the next boundary. You hand it over to the operations team. Now, typically before all these uh, DevOps, MLOps concept, what did we do? Like we had to give it to another team, like the operations team say like, hey, just throw it over the fence, let them deal with it. But now, when we are like passing it over, we talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment, right? So the same thing applies over in the DevOps, sorry, ML ops world, what we call it as pipelines. And see, even in the DevOps world, like if you're using OpenShift, you're using OpenShift pipelines. Simple. I was just going to ask, is, is that like terminology overlap or are we literally referring to like OpenShift pipelines? you know, functionality. So it's kind of like, so traditionally when they were trying to differentiate between the development and machine learning, 
they say like okay developing a traditional application is kind of like a monolithic it's like a single step but with machine learning it's a pipeline of steps you know so it, i would say like it's not wrong to call it as like ci cd or pipelines or or a workflow because you are talking about like um like seamlessly connecting the different pieces so that you know like it can go into an uh, or it can continue to run in an automated fashion so so that's like the ci cd so we you're using like uh, let's say open shift pipelines and and you know for you could also top it up with like uh, like a cd uh, framework like gitops you try to handle the infrastructure as a code and a piece like that and the same thing is uh, possible on the ml op side because now you're using pipelines that's uh, you know we have like data science pipelines that's based on tecton ci cd engine which runs the ai ml workflows so regardless of whether it's a traditional application workload or an ai ml workflow like workflow we're kind of using pipelines to kind of like automate it got it uh, but babuni asked a question here about the um OpenShift AI Administrator course, uh, AI263. I don't know if you know off the top of your head if that's available or not. Um, no, not that I know of, but I could check about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure GLS is working on a lot of these things. Uh, they're very busy these days. Um, so Yeah, I'm, I'm connected with the enablement, so I'm not familiar with the name, but I'm, I, I'm positive that GLS is working on a course right now. Uh, that's on OpenShift uh, administration, but I can't say if that's AI 262 or 263, but but it's definitely coming out and keep your uh, eyes open. Yeah, it's definitely coming out. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, going back to like the different stages, right? Like now you see like, okay, we produce the app or the model and then you're like giving it, handing it over to the other team. But that team, needs to kind of like uh, seamlessly handle these models or like the models. So what, what happens in a DevOps space, you have a code or build that knows it's been tested, it works. Now you want to turn that into a microservice or like containerize it, like run it on top of your platform. So all of this is done, like let's say you're using OpenShift, like everything is done for you. Like you, you can use like source to image, like automatically convert that, you know, like turn it into a microservice, like have an API endpoint. Now the same thing happens with OpenShift AI. So we have like model serving frameworks where you just point to the model. It's it's so easy that when the model is stored in an external object store, you just simply point to it and everything happens under the hood. Like it knows, it picks up the model, like embeds that into a container, depending on how you would want to um, tied to the resources underneath, but in all sense, like it picks the model, like puts it in a container, gives you the API. So that's, so if you look at it between the two worlds, it's the same. You have a usable product. You're converting that into a, an ax, a microservice with an API endpoint. Now and we, and we refer to that generally as model serving. Model serving, exactly. Now, the last part is like, okay, I have a product that's in, running in production, but I, you need to monitor it. You need to make sure it does what it is supposed to do. That's exactly what you do with DevOps as well as ML ops. So, and in, in, in the OpenShift world, like both kind of use like the Prometheus, uh, like the OpenShift container platform monitoring that's based on Prometheus under the hood. But from a user perspective, you're simply monitoring, is the product doing the right thing? If not, then continue running the loop. You go back to the code, change the code, like retrain it, and so forth. Yep. Yeah, so Aggie John here asks, uh, which tools and topics do you recommend to a junior Linux administrator who wants to be a DevOps engineer? Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts or input on that, Prasant. I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, do my do my brain dump on that yeah i mean you, you could do i mean like drawing the paddle from an ml ops world like you know like like learning about ci cds like 
OpenShift pipelines, that's that's what immediately comes to my mind. So, yeah, but I would let you uh, go into the details if you have. Yeah, uh, you know, DevOps is um, sometimes I, I and somebody's going to cringe when I say this. Sometimes in my head, I equate it to the quote unquote full stack developer, right? Uh, because you kind of want to have knowledge of every aspect of the application and the platform to varying degrees. So that might mean, um, you know, understanding RHEL, understanding OpenShift, understanding components of OpenShift, understanding application pieces and all that, uh, depending on where your specific role is and stuff like that. Um, could be heavy on an automation focus, um, you know, course, within the Red Hat portfolio, that's oftentimes um, Ansible and stuff like that. But broadly speaking, I would say, you know, you want to have an understanding of how development happens, if that makes sense. So you don't necessarily need to know like C or Python or Java or something like that, but rather it's, okay, my developers are writing code. What do they do with that code? The so-called inner loop activities. How do they, you know, compile and test that code? How do they, you know, do after they push that code into the repository, what happens with it? Um, you know, what triggers the build process pipelines? You know, what are all the pieces inside of there? Um, all that, um, you know, at the platform level, it's understanding things that affect the application and it being, well, the application doing what the application does. Uh, so maybe that's, you know, how do I do auto scaling? How do I do resource management? How do I do, you know, custom resource management? So think GPUs. Um, there's just, there's, a, it's hard to be precise or it's hard to be concise, I guess, um, terse, because it's a huge broad swath of things um, in my perspective. Um, but I'll say that uh, this, is, this is an area where I wish Johnny was here because Johnny is much better at describing these things than I am because he's done a lot more of it than I did. Uh, the last time I was an active administrator at the at the lower levels was when DevOps was still in its, uh, I'll say, toddler years. It wasn't in its infancy. Yeah, and then to add that, like at least from my personal experience, I focused a lot on like testing the product because I was in a QE team, but testing the product and knowing how it functions and also like how the product is used. That kind of wraps like the whole infinity loop, right? Like. You're talking yeah. about, okay, now I know like um, how the product is uh, functions, like what are the inputs, the outputs, and you know, like what, what needs to be done. So you, when you're talking about like the continuous integration, you write tests, like you kind of like automate that whole part. And once it goes into the production, you want to understand like, what does it really mean when it goes to production? Like how is the software going to be used? Because now, apart from like the inputs and outputs, you worry, worry a lot about like, uh, like uh, the, as Andrew said, like the scale, like, you know, the availability and like, so all sorts of bells and whistles, like the security and also, you know, like what happens in the production, like, does it break in, break down and, you know, what happens if it breaks down, right? Like then it, you kind of like uh, hand it over to the dev and if you want to fix it yourself, like it's good, but that's not necessarily required for the DevOps engineer. That's purely for the dev. Uh, the developer, but for you to like understand like why it failed and to kind of like uh, know that it failed and like uh, passed over, that's what uh, is important here. So I want to I want to hijack your conversation again for a moment, Prasanth. Yeah. So OpenShift AI. I I want to ask, and this is maybe a silly question. Like, what is OpenShift AI? Okay. Now, yeah, so. So OpenShift AI is an ML ops platform. So I, I would go a little bit beyond that because I would say it's a unified development and ops platform. So, cause in, as I said earlier, in a true sense, you're not just developing the model, you want to use it. Mm -hmm. So since like OpenShift AI is on top of OpenShift, we are kind of bringing both the worlds together. So your existing stack or applications are running on OpenShift. Now you develop the intelligence part on top of uh, OpenShift AI, like, and also, you know, like bring both of them together, like put it into operations and everything that goes along with it. So I would say it's, it's an ML ops platform. 
and also the same a unified platform that brings together the traditional app development and machine learning development. Yeah. And, and so Pradeep asked a question here of, does OpenShift AI have generic ready-made models pre-baked into it for immediate usage? And I think the answer to that is no. Yeah, the answer to it, that is no. So we, we do not provide any models. But having said that, like there's tons and tons of like open source models. You can just go to like like hugging phase or like Kaggle. I mean, there are models that's that works and like you can immediately plug them in and you know that that that'll work. Yeah. And the way I would describe that is so if I install OpenShift, right, OpenShift doesn't supply applications out of the box. Right. You can go to any one of a probably a million different places and download container images and applications and deploy them to OpenShift. OpenShift just provides the platform. So OpenShift AI is a platform for doing ML ops on top of OpenShift. So it has features and functions, uh, you know, for, uh, and tools for data scientists who are, you know, writing, you know, or, or building models, I should say. It has tools, you know, features, functions for model serving. Um, and then the underlying OpenShift that it's running on has the ability to host and run the application. Sorry, the dogs just got up. There's lots of shaking and collars and stuff. And so I don't know how noisy it is on my side. Is that is that accurate, Prasant? Yeah, that, that's definitely accurate. And like, because as I said, like, the models have come up so far, like, a lot of the examples that you would find are so accurate in the sense like you grab the data and the, usually like when somebody publishes a model, like it's open source, like they publish it along with the data that was used. You could start with a very simple data that they had and it'll work right off the bat because that model simply was trained for that data, right? So as long as you don't tinker with that, like it should work out of the box. And even if you want to pass new data, it's just look at the example that comes with it, like the same format it was, and then you should be able to work off uh, with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I know, so this is um, yet another of Andrew's tangents. I know there are some models that, you know, it, it has like a base level of training. Mm -hmm. So I, I take, you know, a massive data set, you know, and train a, a model off of that. And then I can refine that model based off of an additional specific user set. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there is the, um, I, I don't know, the the Andrew model. And, you know, it, it was built off of inputs from me specifically. And then it's, okay, now I have that and I want to input, you know, additional data for Andrew's dogs or Andrew's, you know, role at Red Hat and, you know, Andrew's ability to cook or, or whatever, right? And, yeah. you know, it further refines it into these things um, without necessarily having to do a full retrain of that model. So I, I yeah. think we're starting to see more of that come about. Yeah. And um, I think that's another area where OpenShift AI can be beneficial because it gives you all of those tools in one yeah. place. Yeah, definitely. So what Andrew was talking about is like, you know, like all these large language, it doesn't have to be the large language models. I mean, there are like smaller ones in that category. So these models have been pre-built. Let's say, let, let me put it that way. So they've been pre-built for a certain purpose. Let's say uh, you take any uh, lar natural language processing models like Llama 2 uh, from Hugging Face. So these models, they've already been trained on a large uh, data that could be like the English language, like the dictionary, like Wikipedia, WordPress, and so forth. Now, the model understands English language so well so it understands how the sentences are put together like how do words appear like and so forth now you can take this model and forget about like this whole uh part where like you don't have to make it understand english language that's already done for that model now you can take that and say like now let me give you an english sentence and you tell me if it sounds positive or negative now that's a much more narrower use case which you can just find, which what they call it as fine tune this uh, existing model. So that, that, that'll that definitely work. So in all sense, like you are kind of like being more efficient here because you don't have to worry, retrain the whole model again. So, and- It's, it's like teaching it an accent. 
yeah. you know, because there's there's English, you know, yeah. using words, stringing them together in a sentence, and then there's like I live in North Carolina, so there's Southern English, which you yeah. know people know is a distinct dialect. Uh, you know, same thing for Northeast or you know West Coast or you know there's or you know, Texas, Texas has their own accent. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I wish Johnny were here. I'd be poking fun at him right now. Cause he, you know, he's in Texas. Yeah. Uh, so I like to think of the fine tuning as, you know, using your example there of, you know, if the model knows English, fine tuning teaches it different dialects or different accents in order to, uh, to be more appropriate and usable for my specific yeah. use case. Yeah. And, and just like the other suggestion, like there are tons of open source models that already do this. So you can just go download them, access them, um, and try it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess high level, you know, pulling, pulling back up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. so OpenShift AI is not necessarily, or, or is not a, uh, uh, an AI application itself, right? It is a platform for using or building and using models, although you don't have to build it if you don't want to. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to use OpenShift AI for things like model serving. Of course, we would love if you did did that with it, but you don't have to. Um, and I know that there's, I, I know there are other components, other pieces. Um, anything that you that you care to highlight? Yeah. So um, uh, let me look at the, I know like there are tons and tons of, so pieces like, for example, like uh, if you're really interested, like distributed training, because now you're talking about like uh, large models, like uh, pretty like compute intensive models and workloads. We have like frameworks that allow you to do distributed training. And then uh, we have to like for monitoring, we have out of the box performance metrics and like ops metrics. And not just that, like if you're going where like different use cases, like if you're going to build a model elsewhere, but want to bring the model into the ML ops platform and so like OpenShift AI to serve it, that's possible. And you can also take advantage of like uh, everything that comes with OpenShift. For example, like you can use GitOps to kind of like push the models to like multiple edges, edge for edge use cases, like multiple edge devices. So there are tons of uh, options to, that, to do that. And not just these, now, oh, OpenShift AI is, provides a strong foundational platform, but the benefit of uh, with Red Hat is like, I mean, we have a strong partner ecosystem and you can leverage all the additional tools. For example, like uh, if you're having like uh, an NVIDIA GPU, you can also like couple it with like the optimization libraries that come with it. And the default model serving framework that we use is OpenVINO and like we have like if you're using like uh, Intel accelerators and then can also use the optimiz optimization libraries. So in all sense, like users are not tied to a specific vendor or like set of tools. It's, you, this is, think of this yeah. as like a DIY workshop. Like you can just bring in your own tools, like extend the capabilities and like the uh, possibilities are endless here. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, I, I think you said before we started that you have a cluster available, an instance available. Yep. In the last 10 or 15 minutes, um, you know, would you be able to do like an overview or showcase what OpenShift sure. virtual, Open yep. virtualization is? I was good. just having a conversation about OpenShift virtualization yes. before our before the stream. So okay. OpenShift AI. Uh, so for our audience, uh, you know, probably another 10 or 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, go ahead and submit those over. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, and then of course, as Prasanth is going through, uh, ask, ask away, um, love to hear your questions. Uh, again, if you're not watching us live, if you're listening to us or anything like that, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach me Sully at redhat.com, S-U-L-L-Y at redhat.com. No, I, I found that because I've seen, you know, OpenShift AI uh, a few times uh, here recently. So I find that it helps to connect dots for people of what all it looks like and how everything fits together. Uh, you know, when we, when we start to see, just see what it looks like. Uh, I'm still trying to like share the screen just to say. Yeah, no worries. Here, I'll turn. Turn that. Oh, there we go. Just as I went to turn it off is when it popped <laughs> in. 
Okay. So uh, uh, before I go into the product itself, I just wanted to show like a, a slide, like the architecture. So, you know, as I said earlier in the call, like you want to look at it like three pillars, like the model development or training. You might need to put that in presentation mode. Okay. Uh, how about now? Yep. Perfect. So, yeah, I mean, like you have like a dashboard that brings the user into like the actual product itself and different administrative features, like how you control things around. Uh, underneath, we are looking at three main pillars, like the model training, the serving, and the monitoring. And here, like some of like uh, the different features that are available. And what we call as workbenches is what allows user to kind of uh, put together their like uh, project. Uh, think of this kind of like synonymous with the Red Hat code ready workspaces, because with data science projects, you're like choosing an ID, like Jup Jupyter Notebooks, and then like um, choosing your uh, frameworks, like uh, and then like choosing your CPU memory requirements, and you can add on like accelerators if you want. And then, like as I said, like uh, you can choose a notebook image that comes with the product, or you can create like custom notebook images. And as the distributed workloads, we have Qbrake, Codeflare, and we have data science pipelines that kind of like helps you automate uh, the end-to-end -end workflows. For model serving, we have uh, the KSL and model mesh. So there are like two options when you are uh, doing model serving. Let's say you have a bunch of like tiny models, not, not necessarily tiny, but like small, like classic machine learning models. So you can just group them and like put tie them to a single resource like a GPU. So that's possible. But if you want to like exclusively tie, like say if you're working on a like a large language model, it's like much similar like ChatGPT or like Llama 2, you want to tie them to one single resource like a GPU, that that's also possible. Now, serving runtime, so we, the product comes with like uh, OpenVINO uh, and then KiKit. So OpenVINO, it allows you to like serve the models, like how I mentioned before, like once the model is in an object store, like it, you just simply point to it, it, it picks it up, like em, embeds that into the container, like gives you an API so that all the inference is taken care of from that. And uh, KiKit, that's more TG, uh, text generation inference service. That's more specific for um, large language models like Llama 2 because they are they're heavy and you know like they kind of like specialized handling in terms of uh, wrapping the data and the model itself. We now, need a lot of inputs. Yep. Yeah. What's that? Just need yeah. a lot of inputs. So that's yeah. why there's special serving yeah. runtimes for yeah. like an LLM. Yep. And if you want to go the route of like having a custom model serving environment, like yes, you can plug in like Triton, that's from NVIDIA. And for model monitoring, we have like different out of the box performance metrics that's coming up. And all of these are like tied to an object store. And this could be a Ceph storage or like a local min IO the, uh, object store, or it could be a, like an AWS S3 bucket, but all of them are based on like the S3 protocol. Now, as I mentioned, like you could uh, still use everything that comes with OpenShift underneath, like use GitOps, data science pipelines. They use OpenShift pipelines under the hood, like uh, KSELF use like serverless and service mesh, and then the model monitoring uses Prometheus. Now, let me go into the product itself so that you get a view of the product. So this is the dashboard that a user would typically come into. So, and I have like some projects already created. So if user wants to create one, like you simply like create a data science project, think of it like your own personal workspace. And once we do that, anything that's been created in OpenShift AI, it's essentially like an OpenShift resource. And the way you would track it down is simply using the resource name. Let's say, for example, I say like it's my project, and you see like it automatically comes up uh, with that project, or like you could just give it another name. Now, which is essentially a label associated with all yeah. of those yeah. Kubernetes objects. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Now, once the project is created, it'll take you into this uh, space where you can create workbenches, cluster storage, data connections, pipelines, and model serving. 
So workbenches, it's something like the, the dev spaces. So you can, when you create a workbench, it, it says like, select your notebook image. And the reason you uh, need this is like, these are like pre-built images that come with the product and say like you want to use like uh, PyTorch and you go to the package information, it already has other libraries you would eventually need when you're working with a PyTorch framework. And that varies depending on like which one you want to, which one you choose. Yeah, and once so you this choose, is so the workbenches are essentially for a data scientist, the specific yeah. environment that they're going to use to yeah. effectively train the model. Yep, exactly. Uh, so it's, you know, I want to use, um, you know, Py PyTorch or, or yep. um, you know, to create workbooks. Okay, so I'm going to give you effectively a pod that has that deployed inside of there. And I think the deployment size has like how much CPU, how much memory. Exactly. You can allocate GPUs yep. and all of that. Um, and then I think if I remember correctly, it's, um, you know, the, the project storage or the project, um, data sources get brought in. It's, you know, you can yeah. almost think of it like a PVC, but it's not necessarily a PVC. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so that way it has access to all of the things that it needs. So you're sort yeah. of piecing together all of the components that you need to build a model at, at this point. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. Yeah, so when, when you, you can tie it to like the different storage, like the persistent volumes, the the object store where the model will eventually land. And one of the advantages here is like, let's say I create a small container size and I'm trying my uh, development. So, let's, so when you click that, so this is where you go into like a Jupyter interface. Now, let's say I'm trying out the model and I'm running it, but I see that my infrastructure is not, uh, uh, in enough, then I can always come back and edit the workbench and say like, let me move to a much larger infrastructure or like, let me add a couple of more cheap use. So all of this is so easy. Like, so you don't have to like worry about like maintaining the infrastructure, like how you tie it to this. So it happens at the click of a button. So now the users can just focus on training the model. Yeah, and you, you don't have your data scientists going in and like, terminating pods and then yeah. restarting them with different resource yeah. you know, requests and all that other stuff. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And a big advantage of it is like reproducibility, like your teams can collaborate here, like everything is shared. So that, that it works. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, this is where you would do like your, uh, development. Like let's say here, I have a notebook. This is Python based. So, you install any additional dependencies. So the notebook images that come with the product, they have libraries that we think is useful for you. But if you want to add more, you can always do it from inside your workspace. And then you load the data and like build the model, and you train, and then you can actually save the model. So this is, when you save the model, it is actually local. It is in the persistent volume that's attached to this workbench. You would still want to move it to the uh, the object store and you can either do it with the code or you can, if it's a really simple model, you just download it. You can move it to your uh, S3 location. So once that is done, like the next part that comes is like uh, the model serving. So here you can see that you can add your own model servers like Open Vino comes with the product and I added like we've added like runtime, I mean Triton uh, just as a custom image to show like uh, as a custom model serving environment. So that can also be done here. And similarly, similar to the, the uh, workbenches, you can choose the infrastructure that's required for serving the model. So Traditionally, like for like classic machine learning, like you don't need like that expensive resources, but if you're working with large language models, you would still need accelerators like, like uh, GPUs and you can pick and choose them. And how you wanna, you can also control like how you wanna expose the API. You could make uh, it available through an external route, like add authentication to on top of it. 
But for the example here, I haven't like uh, exposed it uh, through an external route. So you would see like an internal route here. So if you see here, like I simply created, uh, deployed the model by just pointing it to the, uh, to its location in the object store. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. So once that is done and it's deployed, you would get an API to that model endpoint. And you could, for the purpose of the demo, I can just probably use it in the uh, notebook. So you simply copy and use that in your code. So I want to point out a couple of things. Yeah. So OpenShift AI is, it's a platform on top of OpenShift, right? Yeah. Um, you could almost consider it an application in its yeah. own right, in the same way that ACM and ACS are. So I have an OpenShift cluster that has a set of resources. Uh, so compute resources, you know, CPU, memory, network, um, storage resources, you know, PVCs, storage classes, all that other stuff, um, you know, GPUs, maybe if I'm doing, you know, for my model training, model serving, depending on what I'm doing, all of that. So from an, if I'm just an OpenShift administrator, it's like every other cluster that's out there. Yeah. And everything that's happening in OpenShift AI is just workload that's deployed as pods inside of the cluster. Exactly. If I'm the OpenShift AI administrator, I don't have to be a data scientist. Right? Yeah. Effectively, what I'm doing is helping connect dots, for lack of a better yeah. term, around, okay, you need access to maybe a, a workbench image that has this set of resources inside of it. So, you know, let's create a new image that we can then introduce in here that out of the box automatically has all of the libraries and tools that you need. Um, and you don't have to go into every one of your projects and create a new one. Um, or, you know, I'm going to provide you with data connections. So, you know, we have this data lake that's on the other end of a wire somewhere, you know, it's a object store, it's a, you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you know, making sure that those types of things are available to them, making sure that, you know, as we do the uh, pipelines and, you know, ultimately model serving, the resources at the OpenShift cluster level are available there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's one of those, like, it took me a little while to realize that OpenShift AI isn't this, you know, completely separate thing that is disjointed and disconnected. It's built on top of. Uh, yeah. You know, just like I, I miss said OpenShift virtualization a moment ago, just like OpenShift virtualization, yeah. just like ACM, just like ACS, yeah. you know, all of these things that it's still OpenShift. You're just looking at it from a different perspective and it's yeah. limited in scope to the things that that persona, in this case, somebody who's doing data science cares about. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is where I said like it's, you don't have to think about like machine learning as this like one-off like magic thing happening outside your usual environment. That's why I use the term like unified platform because you don't have to, it's no longer a magic, like everything that you do on top of OpenShift, you can even handle like AI machine learning workloads and you can seamlessly bring that into your application. So here, like it's just an endpoint. Now you can, no matter like what application you're running on top of OpenShift, you can simply yep. access, send in the data, get the output, and everything yep. is on the same platform. And like you said, it's just a route. Yep. At the at the OpenShift level, it's just a route to yep. access those. Yeah. And so yeah. Go ahead. Oh, and, and the last thing I want to show is like the pipelines. So, you know. Uh, yeah, so if, if you've used like OpenShift pipelines, you're probably like familiar with uh, the interface and like it allows you to automate whatever I showed you in terms of like going through the notebooks, like you can just automate the flow yeah. completely here. So, yeah, and you so can the, see, yeah. yeah, the, the workbook is for effectively writing, uh, I'll say writing the code that trains the model and then yep. the, the pipeline runs that on demand and then yeah. as we see on this one it it does something with it um yeah you know in this case it's it's saving it i'm assuming it's putting it into an s3 store somewhere yeah exactly um, so in this case it's a simple workflow like it trains the model and then it pushes it to your object store but in reality you will have 
the end to end. So yeah, everything yeah, you would have it doing things like going out and maybe refreshing or restarting yeah. the uh, model serving service. Yeah. So that way it it's serving up the newest version and yeah. all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good. Well, I think uh, I think we're bumping up against time. So um, again, from the audience perspective, if you have any last minute questions while we close out here, please go ahead and submit those over. Um, otherwise, again, uh, if you aren't watching us live, if something comes to your mind afterwards, you see the dog poking up here. She's, I made the mistake of petting her a moment ago as she walked by, and now she won't leave me alone. Uh, if you're not watching us live, please feel free to reach out, uh, Sully, S-U-L-L-Y, at redhat.com. Um, so this has been, um, I'll say educational for me to say the yeah. least. Um, and I say that because I feel like every time I start to get a grasp on, uh, you know, AI ML and all that other stuff, it's, uh, people have heard me say before, you know, OpenShift is a fractal. Yeah. Every time, every time you answer a question, it spawns a whole new set of questions. And every time you answer one of those, it's a whole new set of questions, you know, and on and on and on. And, yeah. you know, you could say the same thing about OpenShift AI or ACM and ACS and all yeah. the others, right? Uh, so this has been interesting and educational to me. In particular, I had never, I had, it had never occurred to me that DevOps and ML ops are kind of the same thing, just from yeah. different perspectives, right? Yeah. And different terminology. So that's, that's really useful. I'm going to start using that in conversations that okay. I have going forward. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, I don't know if you have anything else that you want to add, Prasant? I'm, I'm good. It, it was a fun conversation and hope the US have learned a uh, few concepts today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. I uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, uh, to come on and help uh, teach uh, slow people like me uh, a few things. So. Uh, thank you to the audience. Again, really appreciate you all joining us today. Thank you for all of the chat and all the questions that have come in. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out in the future. Uh, oh, Pradeep, uh, does the operator provide the same capabilities as that of the platform that was showcased? And I think the answer to that is yes. Because um, uh, Maybe. Because the operator is deployed on top of your OpenShift cluster, right? So it would be whatever the underlying cluster has access to, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't answer for you, Prasant. <laughs> no, I think like I mean the operator is way like you can just install it. So once you install the operator, like you should be able to see what yeah. I, what I was showing in the demo. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we will see you, or I will see you next week. Um, and I don't know what next week's topic will be, aside from something OpenShift four point fifteen related. So. Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you all later.